Our last speaker for the morning is uh, Lawrence Ritsky, who is a uh, professor of medicine, actually a newly promoted division chief at the Jewish Hospital in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And as I told him last night uh, when he broke the news that he was a new di division chief, that I've heard it said that the two best days as a division chief are the first day and then the last day. So. <laughs> Anyway, Lawrence is going to talk to us about uh, an expertise that he, he's an imager, an echocardiographer with expertise, but he's going to share his uh, um, research and innovations in uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. Lawrence. Thank you, Blair. I'm just going to start with a couple sentences uh, in Hebrew to uh, atone for my uh, grammatical errors last year when I started. As, uh, um, um, so I'm going to switch to English now. I've already embarrassed myself enough. So in terms of my disclosures, uh, this is my financial disclosure. Um, and uh, my other disclosure is So to tie the theme together, uh, I have to be a chutzpani to give a talk in this session on innovation, apparently. Uh, I want to first give credit to Professor Langleyman, who's sitting in the back, uh, who really is the innovator in, in, in Canada in, in pulmonary hypertension, and he is my uh, mentor and my former chief. Um, and uh, the reason why I've gotten into imaging and pulmonary hypertension really is because uh, he has founded and directed our Center for Pulmonary Vascular Diseases, which in fact has been the, uh, the focus of, uh, we've had a couple of Israeli fellows who left last year and did, uh, did some great work uh, in pulmonary hypertension. We're welcoming two more fellows this year as well into our hospital. So I always start my pulmonary hypertension talks with uh, the basic equation, which is really the fundamental equation of cardiology. And it's not even a cardiology equation, it's an electrical equation. It's Ohm's law. And Ohm's law states that uh, voltage is current times resistance. Translated into cardiology, pressure is equal to flow times resistance. So when you have elevated pressure or reduced pressure, is it a flow problem or is it a resistance problem? And everything comes down to this. Uh, the use of imaging uh, really it has a number of purposes. It can be used to diagnose and to screen. It can be used to prognosticate. It can be used to guide therapy, although we, don't have, we do not have any data, any strong data to guide therapy with imaging, at least in, pul in pulmonary retention. And also, very importantly, the innovative side is it can give us some mechanistic insights. So I'm going to go through the evolution of imaging in pulmonary retention for the above. A few background slides. Uh, the uh, most uh, recent classification for pulmonary hypertension is the Dana Point classification, uh, and we're going to be focusing on PAH, pulmonary arterial hypertension, uh, which included the former PPH, or primary pulmonary hypertension, um, and it includes the idiopathics uh, and uh, as well the connective tissue diseases, uh, certain infections, which worldwide HIV really is, is a major player. The other one that we deal with most commonly is actually type 2 or class 2, which is actually secondary to left heart failure. At the pathophysiology, uh, this kind of shows the interplay between uh, the two-hit model, the interplay between susceptibility and, uh, and a risk factor. Um, so the risk factors, uh, as I alluded to, are collagen vascular diseases, in particular scleroderma, congenital heart disease, portal hypertension, HIV, some drugs and toxins. Uh, and you have a susceptible patient, and there are a number of genes. There are five genes which have, have been identified, most commonly the BMPR2 gene. And the combination of these two uh, factors result in vascular injury, uh, which uh, results in endothelial dysfunction, lack of synthesis of all the good humors, and increased synthesis of evil humors. Um, and at this point, it's still potentially reversible, but uh, as this progresses, uh, you get these classic plexiform lesions, uh, and uh, obliteration of, uh, of the distal vasculature, and at this point it becomes irreversible. The challenge with pulmonary hypertension, you can see there's two studies which are in fact uh, 25 years apart. There's really been no progress in how long it takes to diagnose these patients. It still takes on average about two years from the onset of symptoms until the diagnosis. And what's most important is that the survival is related to the NYHA class, to the WHO class. You can see that, that your survival is uh, is quite good if you are, uh, not quite good, but uh, certainly quite a lot better if you're class one or two, and uh, quite poor if you're class four. This is, these are the hemodynamic, hemodynamic correlates. 
And you can see our diagnosis really relies on the hemodynamic correlates of the interplay between PAP, PVR, and cardiac output. And we hope to catch them, obviously, before we have that decompensated right failure, right heart failure. So diagnosis and screening. Uh, the first right heart catheterization uh, was performed by Forsman, we heard, we heard yesterday. Uh, he was a plumber, but he was, did not become a cardiology plumber, he became a urologic plumber because he was uh, disciplined for, uh, for his work. The term primary pulmonary hypertension was described in 1951. Our current definition of pulmonary hypertension is by right heart catheterization, which is a mean PA pressure of 25. For pulmonary arterial hypertension, you have to have that with a wedge of less than 15 and a PVR of greater than 3 wood units. Uh, the next leap forward in diagnosis really was by Jakob Pop in 1984, and they published using Doppler echo to, uh, to diagnose pulmonary hypertension. And we use the tricuspid regurgitation using the modified or simplified Bernoulli equation, whereby four times the velocity squared equals the pressure drop between the right ventricle and the right atrium in systole. So in systole, the pulmonic valve is open as well. So the PA pressure is the same as the RV systolic pressure in the absence of pulmonic stenosis. So we add an estimate of the right atrial pressure based on IVC uh, size and collapse, and we get us a, a, give a, a, see a, a we, that derives the PA pressure. So how good is it? There are a couple of studies here um, by Fisher at uh, Hopkins and Rich at, uh, at uh, Northwestern, which make it look like it's horrible. Uh, so if you look at a bland almond plot, you have effectively plus or minus 40 millimeters of mercury. Well, obviously that doesn't make any sense because some, if on echo you have a, a PA pressure of, of, of 30, it can't be between minus 10 and 70. So um, when, if you look at the curves a little bit more closely, and what I've done is I've drawn a, my red lines at 45 millimeters of mercury. You can see the fit is really quite tight when you're looking at the between normal and abnormal, whereas the scatter really comes and the 90, to 90 and above millimeter mercury uh, setting. But we don't really care whether it's 90 or whether it's 70 or whether it's 110. And in fact, in the pH literature, there's no classifications of mild, moderate, severe. It's kind of like uh, the old uh, Potter Stewart uh, uh, U.S. Senate hearings when they were looking at the definition of, of, of pornography. And the, the this chief justice would say, it's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. So you know when someone has severe pulmonary hypertension. So the bottom line here, and this is a point counterpoint editorial that's going to be coming out in June. Uh, this is my conclusion of, my, of the editorial part uh, in the second to last sentence. Uh, I quote a famous physician, uh, Dr. Seuss, in The Cat in the Hat, who says, it's fun to have fun, but you have to know how. So you have to know the limitations of any technology and any technique. So if you know how to use echo effectively, it can be really an excellent screening tool. Uh, this is just to show that echocardiography can also be used by many different methods to, uh, to fairly accurately derive mean PA pressure and diastolic PA pressure using a number of formulas. I try and avoid the empiric formulas, and I tend to use the ones that make more physiologic sense. And we can also get at PVR, pulmonary vascular resistance, using an index of resistance, which is our, which is our uh, Vmax, uh, our tricuspid valve gradient, which we went through before, and an index of flow, which is the velocity time integral of the R in the R right ventricular elbow tract. And this is the correlation, a very simple formula. And the correlation holds quite tightly up until eight wood units. So echo adds a whole other layer. Uh, here's a patient with a pH pressure of 80. And you can say, of course, there's pH, but why? And uh, so you can see quite clear, this patient has significant con concentric left ventricular hypertrophy with thickened walls. You can see a dilated left, uh, left atrium with a, a volume which is, which is 42 millimeter, milliliters per meter squared, so severely enlarged. And using our transmitral and our tissue dopplers, we get an EE prime. We can see this is clearly left-sided pulmonary hypertension. In terms of prognosis, right ventricular function really is, is the, the key player in, in uh, prognosis. And when the RV fails, the patient dies. When you look at cath, the definition of a right ventricular failure really is a decreased cardiac output or right atrial pressure of more than 10 millimeters of mercury. And some echo labs, in fact, just estimate RA pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury for everybody, so that's not particularly effective. In echo imaging, we have multiple parameters, uh, although, as uh, Bob Levine said yesterday, uh, if, you have, if you require multiple parameters to evaluate function, then none of them are sufficient. But uh, we still have all these, uh, all these different methods. And the, the most recent one is uh, 3D echo. 
you can see you can take three simple planes. Uh, the loop isn't playing, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, you have a, a short axis a longitudinal and sagittal plane, and you can reconstruct and get 3D volumes. Uh, and these correlate quite well with, uh, with uh, MRI in terms of ejection fractions. They, we tend to underestimate volumes. So these are some of the prognostic markers by echo, right atrial size, pericardial fusion, and eccentricity index. Uh, and if you were to go one step further, Avi Shimoni, uh, my uh, former fellow and friend who is now at Soroka, um, together with our pH group, looked at not just the presence of pericardial fusion, but the incident the incidence and the, the significance of the severity. So if you developed a new pericardial fusion, which is small, it didn't really have as much an impact on survival. But if it was a new moderate or, or large pericardial fusion, you can see the survival was, was terrible. So whenever I'm talking to my hemodynamics guys uh, and uh, we discuss the concept in the ICU of what the benefits of a fluid-filled catheter. You can see this underfilled the left ventricle, which is contracting while this patient is on dobutamine and a cardiac output of 3. Point, and and 3.5 liters ECMO. You can see that right ventricle is dead. So if uh, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, a, an echo like this is worth a thousand hemodynamic tracings. Mechanistic insights. Uh, this is a, a landmark study on the, on the left by Eckhart Grunig in Germany which looked at the interplay between genetics and those uh, external stressors. And he took uh, asymptomatic uh, abnormal haplotype carriers in two pH families, and this is dealing with the BMPR2 uh, gene. And if you can see that uh, the non-carriers with exercise did not raise their PA pressure above uh, 40 millimeters of mercury, whereas those with the abnormal haplotype had significant increase in their PA pressure. He took this one step further. Uh, with a much larger cohort uh, of uh, several hundred patients and developed to 90% quantiles. And so exercise, the peak is 42 millimeters of mercury, hypoxia exposure, 40, 43 millimeters of mercury. And here's the gene interplay. Family members, instead of 10%, had a threefold increased risk of raising their PA pressure. If you had the abnormal uh, haplotype, it went up to 50%. So significant mechanistic insights from ECHO. The next uh, frontier really is MRI. Everybody's all excited about MRI. Here you can see the anterior right ventricle, which is severely dilated, creates this septal shift and squashes the left ventricle over here. Uh, MRI, its strength really is at deriving volumes and from volumes ejection fraction. And there's also uh, so a little bit more hemodynamics that you can get at. So excellent using these are the steps that are required to get the short axis slices using a bright blood technique, and we get to end the diastolic and end systolic volumes, and we can calculate ejection fractions. Also, we can calculate by tracing the epicardium, the endocardium, RV mass, and we have some prognostic information for that. The RV to LV area is also prognostic, and we also look at the septal configuration, whether you have that classic D-shaped septum or not. And here you can see that D-shaped septum with a septal, abnormal septal motion. You can see a massively dilated uh, uh, main pulmonary artery. And these are the short axis slices that are traced to derive your, ejection, uh, your volumes and ejection fraction. In terms of function, you can calculate stroke volume uh, and cardiac output from either that RV and diastolic and, and systolic volumes, or you can also use a velocity encoded imaging and, and get the direct forward flow, which is probably more important uh, in terms of uh, physiology. You can calculate strain, both longitudinal and transverse. We have PI dimensions, PA blood, pulmonary art, uh, arterial blood flow, again, using velocity encoded imaging. Uh, and you can also measure PA distensibility, pulmonary blood flow, and you can use uh, gadolinium enhancement to get magne magnetic resonance and geography and look for the, uh, I'm going to get to the classic pruning pattern. Pattern In terms of prognostic markers, indexed uh, stroke volume, RV mass, and uh, both end diastolic volumes on the right side and on the left side. Mechanistic insights, again. Uh, we can look here, uh, uh, this is a study by uh, Anton von Nordgraf's group, von Nordgraf's group, and uh, here this is a uh, phase contrast imaging by MRI of the main PA. This is a normal patient. You can see filling of the PA throughout systole. This is a patient with severe pulmonary arterial hypertension, and you see the presence here of a reflected wave. So you have backwards flow in the middle of systole. And you can see at the timing, it's starting really in, in early systole, and this creates wasted work for the right ventricle because it has to face this added reflected wave. Also look at the PA distensibility over here, and diastole and systole, 
and you can get a relative area change or, a rel rel or an area distensibility. Interestingly, you can actually do this by echo as well, and it's, it's a lot easier. Here you can see, you know, in red, in, in echo the convention is red's going towards the probe, blue's going away from the probe, and you can focus in this area over here. So you have red going, which is towards the probe, in systole in the main pulmonary artery. So that's actually a reflected wave and retrograde flow. You can also get, this is a pulse sample, a Doppler sample volume in the far wall of the right pulmonary artery. You can measure the systolic velocity of expansion with M mode. You can actually look at the, the change in, in radius. This is a work that we did a number of years ago with a Greek fellow. And uh, the V max of expansion in PAH patients was 4.5 centimeters per second, whereas normals it was 7.1 centimeters per second. This is an example of the gadolinium uh, MRA. P it is a normal patient. This is a PAH patient with that classic pruning of the distal vessels. And uh, on an experimental basis, you can also look at pulmonary blood flow. You can also evaluate pulmonary blood flow pre and post treatment. This is an example of a patient uh, post sildenafil, pre sildenafil, post sildenafil, improving pulmonary blood flow. So is MRI a revolution or an evolution? And the people who have trained with me know the answer to every question is, is it talui? And Abi told me about the famous doctor uh, in Israel whose na nickname was Dr. Talui. I can't remember who it was, though. It's probably better that way for me and for him. Um, so you can see if I put red boxes around uh, the, uh, the advantageous, uh, the advantage, uh, advantageous properties of the different techniques, CMR, echo, and right heart catheterization, this is actually by a very, he's really the leader in, in, in CMR and pulmonary hypertension. You can see that they really are all very complementary. And, uh, and you're best served by using all of them. Uh, one of the advantages of echo over here, you can see, is, is tricuspid regurgitation. Here's a patient with severe tricuspid regurgitation, um, wide open tricuspid regurgitation. If you look at what tricuspid regurgitation looks on MRI with their, their beautiful pictures, you have to really pay attention to that little black puff over here. And in fact, if you have somebody with wide open laminar flow, so you can have, uh, you have the forward red flow in diastole, and, and the blue flow in systole, it's, it's, this is wide open, this is laminar flow. You wouldn't even be able to pick that up on MRI. So in this case, MRI is the 1960s black and white TV and ECHO is the new LED 3D TV. In terms of CT, there really isn't much in PAH. It has some use and in fact, all our pH workups in fact do get high res CTs. That's usually to, uh, to diagnose pulmonary parenchymal disease and uh, to help us in assisting in ruling out chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. CT can also be used to evaluate RV volumes and ejection fractions. This just shows you get the exact same views in CMR, CCT, and real-time 3D echo. When you look at the uh, comparisons using MR as your reference standard, in terms of ejection fractions, the bias is really quite small. In terms of volumes, most of the other techniques tend to, uh, echo tends to underestimate, CT tends to overestimate because it actually has better spatial res resolution. So the innovation side, the more intriguing side, uh, looking at pathophysiology is uh, does pH uh, behave like cancer? Um, so w we know that uh, normally we use uh, oxidative-based uh, metabolism. Uh, which is mitochondrial based. And uh, there's some, uh, we, we also know that a switch from this mitochondrial based oxidation to cytoplasmic based glycolysis, even the absence of hypoxia, is recognized in many disease states, mo most classically um, in, in cancer. This is known as the Warburg effect. And uh, this is some recent uh, data which is where this has been described in PAH. So here you can see. Um, you can see the dilated uh, right ventricle, and uh, this is actually uh, the, the, uh, the glucose, uh, the myocardial glucose utilization. Um, so this is an, a very interesting study where they looked at the relationship between blood flow and myocardial glu glucose utilization relative to the mean PA pressure. So you can see that the myocardial blood flow using, this is a, used nitrogen 13, it really stays the same irrespective of what the mean PA pressure is. But th when you look at the myocardial glucose utilization, as the PA pressure goes up, the mean PA pressure goes up, you get, you switch over to increased uh, uh, to glycolytic pathways. So, uh, so in this case, it seems like pH is, is in fact behaving a little bit like cancer. So if pH is a cancer, and we do know that we also have this uh, significant pro proliferation of distal vasculature, 
um, can it be treated? Um, or can we image it like, like uh, cancer treatment? So this is an example of a normal RV again. You don't see glucose utilization over here, uh, the glycolytic pathway over here. It's a patient with PAH. And this is the, uh, in the same study by Oikawa et al. They showed before and after treatment with three months of ibuprostenol. You can see you switch over from glycolytic to mitochondrial based. And this improvement from here to here correlated with the change in RV wall stress and with the change in pulmonary vascular resistance. So early detection, I'm getting close to the end, is of critical importance. We saw how important it is to, to pick this up uh, at uh, earlier uh, WHO uh, dyspnea scores or classes. Uh, we want to detect it prior to RV dysfunction. There's one study suggesting that if we, that we treat patients with WHO class 2, which is the early trial using Vocentan, uh, mostly, uh, mostly uh, PVR and six-minute walk uh, test uh, endpoints, but also looked at clinical worsening. There was significant improvement if you treat them early. But how can we detect it early? So there's a new technology uh, called Pulmobind, which is a Canadian innovation, and that's why this is the Canadian side of it, um, which is a peptide derived from uh, human adrenomedulin, um, and it also can be tagged with uh, Technetium 99. And compared to the traditional lung scan, which uh, is a macro aggregate, which stuck, gets stuck in the larger arterioles, uh, this uh, seems to be small enough to pass through, and it's actually it's a 90% specific to bind to the pulmonary vasculature. We describe pulmonary hypertension as resulting in early vessel pruning. So we could potentially look at the amount of pulmonary vasculature available. Uh, so uh, in order to ultimately non-invasively diagnose pulmonary hypertension. So there's a phase one trial being uh, led by Jocelyn Dupuy at the Montreal Heart Institute, uh, which uh, we are going to be participating in as uh, the, the PH center in, uh, in, in Montreal. So uh, we've all heard about uh, the uh, famous uh, cancer-sniffing dogs, and uh, there was a paper not long ago about the uh, C. difficile-sniffing dog. So what we ultimately need is uh, to train a pH-sniffing dog, and, and I bet if we really want to get that done, this would probably be the place to do it. So uh, I just want to conclude by thanking you again for inviting me. Thank you very much, Lawrence. It was incredible. Thank you very much.